Stop the Week with Robert Robbins. Hello, our conversation this evening comes from Sarah Harrison, the novelist, Nicholas Tucker, lecturer in psychology at Sussex University, Milton Shulman, drama critic of The Standard, and Laurie Taylor, professor of sociology at York University. We have music from Jeremy Nicholas. Well, I was caught, bang to rights. Tut, sir, and you so particular, says Betty Murrell of Horrorbridge. And Peter Bailey of Sidcup says, it should be pronounced like what, and this is where he puts it, like what you try to do with cuttings. A solecism of the gravest order, Maggie Saunders of Kirby Lesoken. Oh dear, I hope I haven't done it again. Kirby Lesoken? Well, you never know. Well, they were all telling me how to pronounce the place in Kent that I called Rotham. It's Rootham, they loudly chortled. Thought everyone south of Watford knew that, cried R.S. Jorkins. Rootham, says P.J. Painter of New Barnet, just pointing it out in a friendly way, you know. Friendly nothing. Catching out of clever clogs is a pleasure unequalled. It brings roses to the cheeks and a spring to the step. And I may say I grovel. No excuse, none whatsoever, since the adult state places upon you the absolute obligation never to get certain things wrong. And high on the list of those things is how to pronounce all proper nouns. No good coming to me saying you thought Froom was from and Hunnit and Honiton. And surely it doesn't matter. Yes, it matters dreadfully. Unless you are deliberately hoping to annoy by pronouncing Glasgow, Glasgow. And I've rather forgotten to do that lately. I remember one of my correspondents saying it doesn't deserve to be pronounced Glasgow. <laughs> anyway, there's nothing fair or logical about being laughed at for getting it wrong. It is absolutely right you should be pilloried. I, I was hearing a story how um, the Welsh Labour MP Leo Abzi was, was giving a talk down in, in Wales and he was introduced by his chairman as Leo Abs. And this went on and on. So after the lecture, um, Absey said to this man, w would you call me Absey? And the chairman looked in for a moment and replied, yes, and then you call me Jonesy. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly the sort of thing that happens when you get a name That's wrong. Very, I'm very delighted very that you uh, got into this trouble, because I knew all along it was Rutum and didn't bother to and correct you, you at all. No, I didn't say a word well, at all. No, I just sort of had sat you, there. Had you not mentioned it, you would have got marks. Yes, but because you, you, were, you, were in, you were in full flight. And, 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 I mean, I remember it was caught up in some you sort see? of little... little Rubbing little, it in, no, you Yes, you were. It cheers everyone up. But then there was a question of how... One could correct you because after after all you've been going on for some time yeah, about yeah, it. Rub it in, yes, no, no, it, but on, and then so at the end of sort of four or five minutes to suddenly say, by the way, in that little symphony you were playing, the note of C was in fact D, would have been to make the whole tune collapse around you, much like the other day when I was expatiating to somebody else upon French structuralism and French neo-structuralism and I was talking about the important work which had been done by Julia Kristeva and I said Julia Kristeva and of course also the person who became eventually her husband uh, Philippe Stoller and the person who was listening to me going on in this way said Actually, I think probably most people would say Soller so I'd stuck a T in, and this was a gentle way I think most people would say. Now, yes. if one had found a gentle little way of correcting you at the end, maybe I'd have done it, but I'm delighted by yeah, all the lessons, really. Thing. There's a curious thing. I'm about to break a confidence, really, a public confidence. I think it's perfectly all right. I mean, no one gets upset, that, which is why you said it just now, about being corrected, about pronouncing proper nouns. But had they been, had it been a common noun, you would have forborne. Now, last week, I'm sure Stephen will forgive me, had Stephen now... Now, really, I can hardly frame the thought of said uh, controversy instead of controversy. I mean, it's impossible that the lad would never have done such a thing. I would never, and a, a more coarse-grained chairman than myself, as you know, <laughs> scarcely exists, but I certainly wouldn't have pointed that out. Yet, if I'd have had time, like you might have had time to point out Rutum to me, I would have pointed out that Lee Hunt is Lee Hunt, not Lay Hunt. And if I'd known as much as one of our correspondents got her here, Maureen Brown of Nottingham, if I'd known what she knew, I'd also have pointed out it was Charles Lamb who desisted from trying to like Scotchmen, not Hunt. What I'm saying is, it's all right, even in public like this, to correct chaps about proper nouns, but not about common ones. Well, this is a bit rich, if I may say so. I was going to forbear to mention this, but yet I have to oh, say it's all now, coming since out it has now. come, <laughs> absolutely, because I remember the first time I ever came onto this most enjoyable show, and we were discussing Careful. pigs, and I let slip the word porcine, meaning of pigs, thinking it sounded so beautifully meaty. And instantly, quick as a flash, this not very coarse-grained chairman came down and he said, very politely, 
I think most of us would say Paul Simon. Did I Paul Simon? And I thought, yes. apart from the else, you can see how it lingers on in the memory, like yes, badly does. cooked crackling. And yes. I seem to remember you came in very kindly uh, on my side. But there are some. You're right about the ordinary I words. Feel, I feel deeply ashamed about that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I shouldn't <laughs> ever have done it. Come. And there isn't a hint of irony what I say. I <laughs> profoundly apologise, Sarah. I really do. Oh, I'm very glad you brought it up. <laughs> How awful of me. But it's just as well that I don't mix in the sort of circles in it you see um, who's going. Things on you see um, commented on in Tatler and things because those are the real horrors, aren't they? I mean, how is one supposed to know without being told that names like you know Featherstone, Hoare, of Fanshawe, and uh, Cholmondeley, and Chumley, and all those, and Fazakerley? And I heard someone. How would you pronounce A L T H O R P? Like Lord, Not isn't it Altra? Not going to no, say a word. A... Not going to say a word. I have a good feeling. It's Altrup. Listen, Sarah, for all that I'm sorry about the other thing, mm. that sort of information only comes the hard way. You're yes. not getting it this for nothing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. No, but I, uh, I stand alone here because uh, I'm, I'm, uh, one of my qualifications for this program is because I don't, don't speak English well, um, oh. uh, that my accent is something of a, a kind of a, a round of amusement to uh, most of the people sitting around this table. Just the rustic and I was, charm. And I was... Uh, I was a reminder of that by my producer who uh, pointed out that I say Bernard Shaw instead of Bernard Shaw. Um, I, can, I can't even say Bernard Shaw. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, you know, and Bernard Levin. Um, so I, I now am very, very self-conscious of Bernard Shaw. And, and I'm also very conscious of uh, the fact when I see this popular program, Dynasty, people just say Dynasty. They don't actually correct me. They just say Dynasty. Joan Collins was terrible in Dynasty. And... You, we go on, I get dynasty, you say dynasty, let's call the whole thing off. But there's a, um, there's, um, as a theatre critic, I'm always concerned about Clytemnestra or Clytemnestra. Or even something else. Yes, <laughs> <I'm denied laughs> <that. laughs> what about Clytemnestra? Uh, well, Clytemnestra. You said yes, you, uh, right. you couldn't resist. No, no, yeah, 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 one of two yeah, things you yeah, can't yeah, resist. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, you can, uh, and I find that when I'm um, dictating things um, to uh, the uh, telephone uh, reporters on the telephone uh, review, and I'm starting with Agamemnon, for instance, and saying A-G-A, and then I'm beginning to lose how to spell it. I say, never mind, let's... Let's talk about Ajax, and Agamemnon <laughs> doesn't get a notice, only Ajax does. But I, I just think about the way in which you were talking about the, 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 the fact that if you hear somebody make a mistake about the name, the way in which your particular uh, piece could be said to have been undermined by getting that one single uh, mispronunciation in the middle of it. It was rather like when you hear DJs or these people who come on very, very enthusiastically, yes, very, very affectionately, and they say, Hi there, hello, it's me. Yes, indeed. Sarah, you mentioned uh, Fazakerley before. I can remember on Radio Luxembourg one night hearing somebody talk about Fazza Curley, <laughs> which they'd got, yeah. you know. And like Fazza Curley was... Now, it was particularly Radio Luxembourg, because you always assumed that, I suppose they were English yeah. people, but they had transatlantic accents, and one thought they hadn't been in England for a long time. But it was rather odd because no programme, if you remember, ever spent so long spelling out a single place name, which is Canesham. Uh, I mean, yes. Luxembourg was where Canesham and Horace Batchelor yeah. were born. But well, I'm well, surprised that you, as a sort of uh, grafted on, naturalised Liverpudlian, don't recognise that uh, people in Fazakerley are quite likely to pretend it's Fazakerley, <laughs> just to fool, you know, but people like this job. Well, this reminds me very much of, of my, like Laurie, my, my years at the Blackboard when I was a teacher, when... Part of the authority of the teacher was all to do with defending how names are actually said. And when, if, if a child in the class had said Fazakerly or, or whatever he said, Fazakerly, I would have then thought this is somehow getting at me. And very often I was right, because they deliberately mispronounced other teachers' names in the hope that I would then repeat it. And then there'd be this scale of <laughs> laughter. And that's why I think the whole, I, I mean, anybody can say controversy or controversy, nothing too much interesting than that. But you're, there's still a feeling that the name is the essence of the person. And if you don't game. say it properly, yes. you're going to get it wrong. And the only time I ever got my own back on these kids was once when I came in the room and somebody had thoughtfully put a four-letter word on the blackboard as a sort of introduction to my parents in the classroom. <laughs> and quick as a flash, I turned to the class and said, would the child who's written his name on the board come and rub it off, please? <laughs> and instead of laughing, bad, instead of bad. laughing, they said, oh, nobody's called that hair <laughs> It was too important a matter. It's the essence of the person. Sarah. Uh, I'm just thinking there's a whole special 
specialised area of, of characters in fiction and you only read the name and you think you know how it's pronounced and then all of a sudden somebody comes up with it. I remember the first time I took my children to see that cartoon version of The Jungle Book and all of a sudden they were talking about somebody called Mowgli and I could have sworn that was Mowgli. It bothered me terribly that. It really put me out. And I thought, is it me or the rest of the world that's mad? And also there was another, I can think of another example. My, my, my young son, we read a book about, about a, a sort of fearsome rhinoceros general who was called Rataxes. I thought it was so much nicer that he should be called mm. Rataxes is my son. But <laughs> look, my no, son, yes. what, uh, you him. get, you see, coming off the, the, the proper nouns are all right. No one's embarrassed mm. about it, but it's the common nouns. Now at the TUC conferences, they have a composite motion. Now, I have heard very high-born members of the Labour Party follow suit and refer to it as, as, as composite. But I just wonder if you are a capitalist who wants to keep on the right side of someone who thinks you're a capitalist, do you capitulate? Or is that the most slavish sort of snobbery? Well, that is, that is, that's, that's, that's very important because, of course, the ways in which middle-class people who are Marxists actually use the short A in class has become very, very... Oh, the working class. You always know how far to the left the middle class are moving by the way in which the A in working class changes. But it's, you were just going Nicholas's memories about children, but that was a game that they used to play of mis mispronouncing names, because in Liverpool... They always used to refer to the Adelphi Hotel as the Atelphi Ottle. They loved the Atelphi <laughs> Ottle. And, and Harrogate, uh, Herogity, was, was, you know, was one that they invented, this sort of nice name. And there is something about a collection of mispronunciations. I mean, even, you know, the ways in which people repeat that classic little American pronunciation of genuine Bedouin Arabs, you know, which, which is delightful because you're in the know as well. There was another yeah. very genteel Liverpoolism that was quoted to me. There was a cinema, and no doubt still is, called the Palais de Lux. But if you were very genteel, you called it the Pali de Lou. Oh, dear, oh, but dear. You, but you, you get sad. involved with foreign foreign names, like yeah. Borges or Borges. What do you, how do you pronounce it? You're Borges, the expert. Of course, oh, Borges, right. Borges, actually. <laughs> sort of uh, being bilingual uh, yeah, in how do the you language. Spell it? Uh, of gramophone records, alphabet. that's where you learn that. And um, I was uh, I'm a member of a panel. Uh, to choose a, a great international figure in the theater of films who um, somebody in Japan, in the Inonori Foundation, is going to give no less than 45 million yen to. 45 million yen for a prize. I thought I'd better send in my, my, uh, my uh, nomination for this award. Um, and uh, the address, I think, would be, would be marvelous for anybody to uh, attempt to um, uh, swallow. 87, Kanko Boko Cho, Shijio Doro, Muromachi, Higashi Iru, Shigamo Muyuku Ku, Kyoto 600, Japan. Well, now, that, whether that? that's an address or an address, <laughs> I think you've got the right to be there. But I was always content to refer to Penzance until I ran into a grandee in that area, and he referred to it as Penzance. <laughs> now, I wondered to myself, was this, you know, for a baronet and upwards that sort of pronunciation, or was it the sort of, was it a test? So that, you know, some slavish tourist might start saying Penzance and then get laughed at. Well, I don't know about Penzance, but you might feel you were getting above yourself if you use the phrase thick as a plank after this week, wouldn't you? Yes, thick as two planks, of course, in East Molesey, thick as a four-inch plank mm. elsewhere, or in Liverpool, I wonder if Laurie can confirm this, but it's so, thick as a short deal. Now, I never knew what this meant when it was used by a member of my family. Till late in life, I realised deal is wood, so deal means plank, but why short deal? I don't know. Anyway, did she really mean it, or was it self-deprecation as a form of Chinese courtesy? Well, I, just to, to add in, daft as a brush as being some oh, sort of like North Country little one. But, but, but I think that perhaps a little bit more applause was needed for, for, for her saying that than she received. Because it's, it, it, it's very difficult, or becomes increasingly difficult in, our, in, in, in the public relations landscape which we live in, to, to, to be modest about anything. And whenever you are modest about anything, now whenever you make any slightly self-deprecatory statement, then there's likely to be someone around motive-mongering and saying, oh, well, this really means this, or she would only have said that, or that could only be possible. I mean, why is it somehow now impossible for people to arrive, say, doing something like a cricket commentary, to arrive and say, hello, so-and-so, so-and-so commentary, but I'm afraid I'm not quite as good as John Arlott at the moment, or to have someone of the, who's just moved into the Treasury to say something like, I'm afraid I've just moved there only yesterday, so I don't know much about it. Or even, best of all, to have parents say, I'm afraid we weren't very, very good parents. It's as though there are so many areas where it's no longer, more and more areas, 
are, that are denied the possibility of anybody saying anything modest about their, their ability within those. So that as soon as someone comes along and says, I'm afraid I'm not very good at that, people say, well, it's, it's a way of backing shyly into the limelight. It's a way, in fact, of declaring that really you are, because really if you went, you wouldn't draw attention to it. I think we should be more generous. Well, I, th I, I must say, I, th I thought she meant it, uh, meant it and it only added to her charm. But I do think in general that people who say that sort of thing, you feel they're really saying, you know... Um, you know, the man who says, I can't even change a fuse or I'm no good mm. at some. They're really saying, but uh, I can do a lot of other, much more important things. So I, I don't know that you can scoot I, that out I'm of it. I'm not so sure. I think the English really do admire any man who has no talent and is modest about it. <laughs> now, in Lady Di's case, I felt she really meant it because, after all, all the facts about her O-levels and CSEs or whatever she hasn't got are so well known. And I felt very depressed by it because she, she said the remark, I'm as thick as a plank, when somebody asked her to play a totally idiotic and fruitless game called Trivial Pursuits. <laughs> and somehow to live in a society where people feel they are measured by whether they can play a game like that, rather than, say, do other things that seem to be far more worthwhile, possibly the sort of things she's even doing now with her own family and husband and so on, seems to me very depressing. Well, I, but, and yeah. I'm sorry she felt, you know, I'm sorry we put in a position where she has to feel... Well, this of course, at this remark. moment, she's probably just sort of frying them up something for their high tea, but, <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's at least as important, but... What what I liked was she also said she didn't she didn't get beyond reading the instructions to the games for her children and any man who has tried to explain the rules of Lyodice to three or four nine year old girls you know his heart goes out to her I mean one does sympathise yes. I, I feel it's the non-specific quality I mean I think we've uh, got the Princess of Wales issue out of the way she's an all round good egg and I'm sure she meant it but. You see, I feel this sort of blanket disclaimer. You know, you kind of throw a blanket over the parrot's cage. You say, oh, I'm an absolute duffer. You're offloading all that onto the people around you who then mm. really are, feel obliged to go into a paroxysm of self-excuse for knowing it themselves, who yes, have then the true. obligation to make you feel better about it. And what about... They're all sorts of dreadful, sort of pseudo-humble self-introductions. Although those dreadful people always the most emphatic and appalling people you know who say, it's only us. You know, that <laughs> lot. And those tiresome film stars and models who go on about their big hips, you know, and, and you, where does that leave the rest of us, I'd like to know. I think one I think of the worst it's... cases of that was Harold Wilson, who kept boasting about the fact they never got past page two of Das Kapital. <laughs> And I thought, for the leader of the Labour Party, that seemed to be hardly a distinction that we should all be pleased by. But the, the, you've got the other situation where if you do say that you are somebody important, you know, you get rather curious reactions. I was reading about Sir John Hall, a physicist, he was a former chairman of the UK Energy Authority, and he found himself in a crowded train with a party from a local mental hospital. And as the train pulled into the station, the nurse in charge of this party began checking off the party before they got off. And she turned to Sir John. She said, who are you? And he said, I'm chairman of the Atomic Energy Authority. <laughs> and she said, oh, yes. And the nurse continued to count. Four, five, point to him, six. <laughs> That's got to be an old one, but I've never heard it before. You, do you know what I liked about it? When the, the lady said, thick as a plank, I thought it was, well, I don't know. I got a slight frisson that someone so gently nurtured should even know what a plank was. <laughs> I mean, I thought Marx should be awarded there for worldliness. Yes, you see, but it's I see that it was like Sarah is coming back and, and, and is doing this business because it is very, very funny to produce examples of those people who go in for a little bit of self-deprecation to show that really it's rather a tedious way of drawing attention to themselves. But if, here's another example this week. Perhaps we should just have a little new sheet which records these because Norman Willis was on the, the, the midweek programme and halfway through this somebody said, well, t t so, so what made you want to go into trade union affairs? And he, and he stumbled a little bit. He said, I, it was, th th he made one or two false starts. He said, and then he said, I'm afraid I'm not very good at this. He said, and yet, I suppose I should be. And that was, that was perfect. It was delightful. And in a way, much nicer to hear than those clever remarks, like, say, Edith Sitwell's clever little remark, like, I often wish I had time to cultivate modesty, but I'm too busy thinking about myself. I mean, I, I, what I like, I mean, here's a lovely little story. I mean, the nice advantage of, say, something like silence, of not telling people of your achievements, which is another way, and, and you know, another pleasant form, which is so, so little about. That's, that's the Auden story, which 
Bob, you'll probably know about Auden discovering from a third party that a, that a friend of his who was a sculptor had in fact uh, had some verses um, published in the New Yorker. And, and Auden said, how nice of him never to have told me. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, no, I didn't know that. I, I'm all for that. See, I, I don't think, see there's necessarily an alternative here that I don't think it's necessary for people to boast. I also think to, to thrust your disadvantages into the conversational arena is an equally egotistical thing to do. Now, if you do that in another culture, I mean, from Chekhov's plays, whenever anybody says, I'm stupid, people say, yes, yes, you're stupid, all right. But in England, as Sarah said, immediately somebody announces something wrong with them, the rest of the company has to tie themselves in power. But that is the fault of the person, like that. That's the fault of the person doing the announcing, you see. I mean, the games yeah. that you're describing are things like Eric Byrne talks about wooden leg. He yes. describes it. Archbishop who was lecturing on humility, and he was asked by a student, uh, Your Grace, which is the best book on humility? And the, and the archbishop said, there is only one. I wrote it myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, the, the, what there is, you see, Nicholas, what there is that some modesty, some public modesty, does something to reduce the horrors of envy, doesn't it? It, it just, and, and, and not just referring to some little aspect of yourself. I'm aware I was looking at a study the other day of someone who'd gone through and looked at all the, pr all the speeches made by those who had won the Nobel Prize, looking to see the ways in which, what sort of style of humour they were using. The humour was always a little self-deprecation of a small area that's, I'm afraid I'm not very good at algebra would say someone who had won the Nobel Prize for nuclear physics now I'm not talking about that but I'm talking about something which you can recognize as a realistic evaluation that the person is making which might exist alongside a true pride a true modesty and a true pride going together oh, would be can. rather splendid things to have it can I, I just uh, we're gonna have a song now I just I just like the I like the way she chose as thick as a plank rather than other ones. She couldn't possibly have said as dim as a tock age lamp because that's far too other <laughs> rats, yes, isn't lovely. it, really? But what she might have said, and you'll find it in Partridge, is a um, splendid variant, as thick as two cavalry subalterns. <laughs> and, but I think it's rather sporting that she overlooked that one and went for the one that we all of us could fully understand. What we're going to fully understand now is a splendid... Oh, it's got a marvellously, uh, you know, play on words type of title from Jeremy. He calls it Idle Vice. <laughs> My butler's incredibly idle. He's never around before age. It's a terrible bind, for it means I'm confined to my bed. I must lie there and wait. At ten he will draw back the curtains and serve me my breakfast in bed. I then lie back and yawn until the bath has been drawn and consider the long day ahead. I dictate all my letters while soaking. My secretary sits by the tub. Her shorthand is fine, but I don't like to whine. She refuses to give me a scrub. I'm up and about by eleven. My shirts have been ironed and pressed. My valet must choose from the hundreds of shoes which he puts on for me. Then I'm dressed. A call to my stockbroker, Boski, to check that my shares are OK. Five minutes of fun, and then the day's work's been done, and I'm ready to go out and play. I lived in a first-floor apartment, a jolly nice family gift. There are two flights of stairs, but quite frankly, who cares, or I always go down in the lift. The chauffeur is ready to take me in search of some bubbly and grub. So I jump in the car, it's a Rolls LKR -OK for the 200 yards to my club. A light lunch and light conversation, amusing and nothing to eat. Just two or three courses, a bet on the horses, then back home to get some more sleep. In the evening, Diana or Sarah will come round or give me a call. We might lounge about or perhaps we'll go out if I'm feeling like moving at all. I'd go to the theatre more often and the opera too, they're sublime. But the thing I abhor, which is oh such a bore, is one having to turn off on time. When the performance is over, I'm far too exhausted to clap. My friend takes me to eat prior to our retreat for a quick bit of tickle and snap. 
weekends I just watch the telly To recover, relax and unwind I sit round and laze in a vodka-filled haze Till I'm quietly out of my mind Now some people might doubt his existence And say that the story's been fetched much too far Well, you're clearly naive if you do not believe There are others like him, cause there are It's difficult when you're a thickhead And born with a large silver spoon Does anyone know where these chaps ought to go Like a nice one-way trip to the moon Well, there we had Idle Vice, I repeated Because, oh, the play on words, you won't have missed it uh, And a sort of harmonic introduction To something called National Motivation Week And it's trying, this National Motivation Week To find the laziest man in England Britain even And appears to be expecting volunteers But anyone volunteering isn't lazy And would thus be disqualified But laziness is quite hard to diagnose in my own household, I think it's got something to do with stepping over the same anorak seven or eight times without even thinking of picking it up. Or is it the person who stops the lift to travel one floor to ground level? In the days when lifts had lift men, I knew a sour-faced custodian who simply treated the first floors they didn't exist. Anyone who asked for it was let off at the second, and anyone wanting to travel from the first floor had to walk down to the ground before he could begin the ascent. I remember the old Calvinist well. He had a face like the axe marks on a chopping block. But these are fairly obvious instances. I think laziness takes subtler forms. It's a very unstable state, isn't it, laziness? It can so easily topple over into mindless activity. Uh, I mean, I'm just... Uh, I think that I am being lazy. I find it very, very difficult to be properly lazy. I suddenly find I'm doing something like reading my microwave instruction book and I know that in fact I'm no li it's got to be the exact opposite almost of lust I always think was like <laughs> lust stirs you up and impels you out laziness should be thoroughly detumescent you could actually feel energy draining away from you in the same way in which lust you feel it rising within you this yeah, is a fairly airy fairy mm -hmm. way of thinking of it but I'm very glad yeah, for the example see, it isn't an objective physical or mental condition laziness it's a comparative judgment mm -hmm. Uh, and the, the kind of job we all make about ourselves and about others. Uh, to the uh, energetic man, you know, the ball of fire, probably everybody's lazy. Everybody around him is lazy. Uh, Beaverbrook was a man just like that. He had overactive glands. And he, he, uh, and, he, and he expected everyone to be driven the way he was. And I remember when my wife told him she was going to marry me, she was a journalist on the uh, Express Group as well, and he said, oh, he's a good writer, but he's lazy. He'll never get anywhere. You can tell by the way he slumps when he sits in a chair. <laughs> now, I thought to myself, now, what are, are there physical indications of laziness? Do, do you actually, is it bent knees, sort of uh, 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 hooded eyes? What are <coughs> the, can you tell a lazy man just by looking at him? No, you've mm -hmm. got, you, th you might mm -hmm. think you could, but I'm just, mm -hmm. what you described was almost... Um, a, a description of that picture of uh, Lytton Strachey by Henry Lamb, mm. in which Strachey looks the most droopy piece of work, as well as being twice life size or even three times. And yet, he wrote all those books well, and that right. took a bit of yeah. doing. So you can't, no, the surface won't tell you a thing. Well, I think the more you think about a word like lazy, the, the less easy it is to know what on earth you're talking about. And Billy Bunter is always described as very lazy. He's always cutting the cricket nets and so on. But give Billy Bunter a person postal order and, and a tuck shop, he, he'd be, have no ever, uh, you know, trouble at all in racing over there. So I'm beginning to think that laziness means when other people aren't doing the things you think they should be doing. Yes, and therefore yes, it's an extraordinarily true. subjective feeling. And I think it, the rage we feel at other people's laziness isn't just that they aren't like us. There's also a nagging suspicion they might have got it right, mm. that us Absolutely. rushing about with our clipboards are challenged by these people sitting down in yes. a chair, and after all, they might actually be doing better than us. Could be. I, yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. I do agree. I think a lot of the irritation caused by laziness is because we <laughs> admire those people. And in fact, I think we're approaching time when we should revere the lazy as the mad used to be revered as a sort of race <laughs> apart because I think laziness is actually the enviable attribute of people who don't need the crutch of activity after all the opposite of lazy surely is industrious not busy and well, I might say here that I do think my, my definition of a, of a lazy person and I like it I like it very much as a friend of mine who actually wouldn't change up 
out of second when she left traffic lights because she knew there were some more traffic lights 200 yards <laughs> oh, further along no, the road. First you know. rate, first but rate. I do, I find laziness an attractive quality. But it just isn't attractive. And it's and it's positive. You see, what you're getting at is it does not necessarily show itself in an obvious form. Now, people like yes. me who work like beavers, and I do work like a beaver, are really, we don't look lazy, but deep down in our hearts, yes. what we're doing is trying to get rid of the work. And you know you can only get rid of the work. You can't do slipshod work. That refines our irritation. You can't do slipshod work because slipshod work isn't got rid of but what we're doing is attending to every last detail of the work we do in order to be in a position where there is no work to oh do. yes it, we we, we yes. aim at idleness yes so it has lazy. to be it has to be done instead of work and it only exists alongside work i mean it really would be rather ridiculous to talk about unemployed people as being lazy. It would be very difficult to be lazy if there was no work that you should be doing. I mean, it's only that moment when you suddenly find yourself watching, for example, my my definition. I know that I have managed to become lazy when I find myself watching the regional news after the main news on television in the evening. I think yeah. if, if I'm looking yes. at this, then I know that I am really being lazy. But you see, Bob, coming back to what you say, I, I know you work very hard, but you see, I think in a peculiar way, you taking on another big project rather than, say, letting yourself have a weekend of total absence of work, in a sense, is a lazy choice. My dear but fellow, I, I I've said somebody... it before and I'll say it again. Yeah. You just don't listen. That no, was no, my no, point. No, 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 yes. really, no. I was really listening hard this time. Well, Let you me didn't. Very I can't give you said more than about time. two out of ten. I'll <laughs> just <laughs> tell you that a friend of mine must in try Canada... harder. Uh, they had these things called outward bound holidays and one thing was to be cast away on some sort of island with nothing to do except a notebook to keep for, for 48 hours and she said it was the most exhausting period of her life now for her to have thrown herself into a normal busy activity would it in fact have been a lazy reaction You're rather than facing right. up to enforced idleness which in fact was I can't, not a lazy I can't, reaction I can't hope to have put it as charmingly as you have but I did put it more or less in those terms, and really, bus busyness, as, as Sarah was saying, it's not quite the same as industry, but whether it be industry, whether it's Beethoven, whether it's Shakespeare, or humble persons like ourselves, there is an aspect of it which is dr the drumming of fingers, so that we shall not be a a allow ourselves to face the absolute that lies behind the activity, which is little more than birth, copulation, and death, and may be less than even that, may not mean uh, a thing. I think we should distinguish between laziness and idleness and I think there's a difference between the two laziness I think is is instinctive and natural I think idleness is something that has to be cultivated idleness is a, a, is, is a determination to do little or nothing at all and that's very difficult to do and Maynard Keynes uh, asked his wife uh, Lydia what she was thinking about nothing she said I wish I could do that, said Keynes. Well, you know, paradoxes, mm? paradoxes abound in this. Now, here, one of the terms of this competition to find the laziest man there is, is that candidates must watch more than the national average of 25 hours television a week. What enormous effort <laughs> must be involved in achieving such stupendous inertia? I rather like the story of John Barrymore, who apparently in 1906, he was renowned for being lazy, and he used to sort of like sit around in states of great languid mood, and in such a state, he actually missed the San Francisco earthquake of that year. <laughs> Sarah Harrison, Nicholas Tucker, Milton Chulman and Professor Laurie Taylor were stopping the week with Robert Robinson. Jeremy Nicholas provided the musical interlude and the programme is produced by Michael Ember. Oh.